now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. J. Edgar Hoover called it the finest program on the air. This is your FBI. This episode from late in the run on ABC, August 15th, 1952. And this episode is entitled, The Dime a Dance Stick Up. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents, This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight... The subject of our FBI file, Bank Robbery. It's titled, The Dime a Dan Stick Up. The special agents of your FBI are drawn from many different sections of the country. Some come from well to do homes. Others are the type of men who, as boys, did odd jobs after school to augment the family income and then went on to work their way through college. But whether their background is luxury or hard knocks, the men of the FBI have two common denominators. These are courage and mental alertness. Courage to face the armed killers of the underworld. Mental alertness to seize on the one clue in a carefully planned crime which leads finally to its solution. In tonight's case, we see special agents of your FBI proving once again that they possess mental alertness and courage. Tonight's file opens in a shabby second-floor dance hall located in a large western city. It is early evening. One of the hostesses is seated at a corner table as another hostess approaches. Hi, Jane. Oh, hello, Grace. Mind if I sit here a minute? Ooh, my feet are killing me. It's a shame. <sighs> How many tickets you got so far, kid? Three. Three, huh? Um, look, you mind if I tell you something? No. Well, you're, you're brand new here, honey. I've been at this thing a long time, so <laughs> I feel entitled to give you a little advice. I, I wish you would. Yeah. You don't sell enough. Sell? Uh-huh. Laugh, talk, turn it on. But, Grace, I try. Nothing comes out, sweetheart. Well, what do you suggest I do? I mean, what should I laugh and talk about? Uh, talk about him. That's all the guys are ever interested in. Oh? Butter him. Laugh up his jokes. Don't look so sad. <laughs> you just got to remember there'll always be nights like this. Well, I... Wait a minute. Here comes a guy now. Turn on the charm and nail him. No, you dance with him, Grace. Nah, none of that. Stand up and let's see you go to work. Come on. Come on, go on. Hello there. You want to dance? Oh, sure. Here's a ticket. Come on. Excuse me, Grace. By all means. My, but you're an awfully good dancer. Uh Uh-huh. You just seem to have so much rhythm, don't you? Yeah. Do you do you come here often? I certainly hope so. You just dance so wonderfully. Is there another way out of here? Huh? Is there any way you get out besides those front steps? Well, yeah, fire escape. Where is it? Right behind those curtains in the back. We'll dance over there. Why? Please, just do like I say. You you want to leave? That's right. But we just started dancing. Look, just let me. Huh? Oh, you're hurt. It's nothing. You're. Your shoulder, it's bleeding. Is this where the door is? Yes, but... Take the rest of my tickets. Just let me get out. And do me a favor. Forget you ever saw me. Wait. Huh? That shoulder, I can't let you... Look, I'm coming with you. The 
following morning in the local field office of your FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting his fellow agent, Chet Logan. Uh, hello, Chet. Welcome back. Thanks, Jim. How's the vacation? Great. You been in to see the boss yet? Yeah, that's what I'm doing here. He wants me to work with you. Good. I can use some help. What's the story? A bank job. Four men held up the Travers National. How'd they work? Well, one man went into the bank and did the actual job. Two others stood guard outside. Fourth man stayed in the car. Any identification? Well, the teller at the bank saw the one who did the actual stick-up. No mask? Yeah, yeah. He had a handkerchief over his face, but he got a coughing spell and it slipped down on him. The teller's downstairs now going over our file of pictures. Any idea on the others? No. There's uh, one thing about the holdup that puzzles me, though. What's that? Well, the bank is situated on a corner. The getaway car was parked right in front of it on Main Street. Yes. When the bandit ran out of the bank, he didn't make for the car. Instead, he turned the corner onto 3rd Avenue and ran into the railroad station. Um, what happened then? Well, according to a few of the eyewitnesses, one of the men in the gang ran after him, but he got away. The other two drove off in the car. That is odd. Mm -hmm. Anybody think to get the license number on the car they used? Yeah. When the car turned up abandoned this morning. There's not a good fingerprint any place on it. How much did they get? 18000 no, Special Agent Taylor. Yeah, Mark. He did fine. Yeah, thanks very much. That was ID inspection. Teller just definitely identified a thief named Gibson as the man who did the job. Are they sending up Gibson's record? As soon as he gets here, we'll go to work. feel any better? Who are you? Jean. Jean? Oh, oh, you're the girl from the dance hall. That's right. Where am I? This is my place. I I brought you here last night. Oh, what? Oh, shoulder. I bathed it, put a bandage on. You made me promise not to call a doctor. Did you call one? No. Thanks. Uh, can you eat something? No, not just yet. I, I've got to be getting to work pretty soon. Well, what time is it? About six. At night? Uh-huh. I've really been out. Wait a minute. What'd you knock yourself out for? What do you mean? Bringing me here. You needed help. I can't pay you nothing. I didn't expect anything. Oh, I'm sorry. I know what it is to be alone. You need somebody to help you. Oh, I uh, suppose you've been wondering what this is all about. Why I got shot. I didn't ask you, did I? No. There's some guys who want to get their hands on me. Gangsters? No, I guess you'd call them that. Why don't you call the police? I can't. Why not? They'd help you. I'll explain some other time. Well, you better get some more sleep. You leaving? Yeah, I'm going to work. Jean. Huh? I'm going to ask you one more favor. Will you call the place I work? I'll give you the number. And tell them I won't be in. Sure, but... But what? You never told me your name. Oh. It's Gibson. Larry Gibson. <laughs> happened while I was out? Uh, Bill called. He went out and examined the car that was used in the bank job, but he couldn't find a thing. Uh, any news from the police? No. How'd you make out, Jim? I finally found the hotel where Gibson was living. Was living? Yeah, he checked out the morning of the stick-up. One of the bellboys said that he took Gibson's bags down to the railroad station, checked them, but he never came back for the claim checks. That's funny. I got the claim checks and went down to the station. The bags were still there. Did you go through them? Yeah, but there wasn't anything in them. There might be a lead, just some shirts and socks and two old suits. It sounds like he intended to come back for the checks, but never got a chance. Yeah, I guess it must be it. He must have just grabbed a train when he ran into the railroad station. You have any friends at the hotel? No, Chetty was a loner, but the clerk told me he was sick a lot. He used to use the house doctor. Did you get to see him? Yeah. He told me that Gibson had quite a bad case of tuberculosis. Well, that would explain the fit of coughing during the stick-up. Yeah. But it doesn't explain why he didn't use the getaway car. Jim, I'm convinced he ran into that railroad station on purpose. It wasn't just the first safe place. I'm inclined to go along with you on that. I've got the switchboard working on something now that might prove you to be right. What's that? Well, the doctor up at the hotel told Gibson to go away to a sanitarium up in the mountains. Any particular one? No, he gave him a list of places. I see. Special Agent Taylor. Yo. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, now, will you put through a call to police headquarters up there for me? That's right. Thanks. Switchboard, Chet. They've located Gibson at one of the sanitariums. Good. Uh, will you hold down the office? I'm going to take a run up there right now. <laughs> you last night? I went home. What happened to that tall kid you were dancing with? Who? Your last customer. Oh, he didn't feel good. He needed some fresh air. Mm-hmm. So you went out the back door with him and down the fire escape. How do you know? I saw you. Oh. Hey, look, Jean, I, I don't want to run your life, but be careful, huh? What do you mean? Well, that tall kid's red hot. I... I don't understand, Grace. There was a guy in here last night after you two left. He was looking for him. A cop? No, a hoodlum. And he's here again tonight. Where? Walking toward us right now. In the brown suit? Uh-huh. Grace, what'll I do? That's too late for anything now, honey. I got some tickets here. I want to dance. Ah, uh, with me, honey? No, honey. With her. Oh, uh, well, she's kind of tired. I Shut up. They... Come on, sister. But... Dance, I said. I said... My, but you're an awfully good dancer. You just seem to have so much rhythm. Stop the routine. Where's Larry Gibson? Who? The guy you took out of here the back way last night. I don't know what you're talking about. You took him out of here. He didn't go home, so he must have gone to your place. Where you live. That, that's none of your business. Look, you better answer me. I don't have to. And I don't have to dance with you either. Find yourself another girl. <laughs> That's your Jean? Yeah. I think this is pretty early for you to be home. Uh-huh. You didn't get fired on account of me, did you? No, Larry. I came home because you're in trouble. What do you mean? A man came up to the dance hall. He was looking for you. What was his name? I don't know. Danced with me. He asked me where you were. What'd you tell him? I said I didn't know. What'd he look like? Short, with... Black hair and a mustache. And a scar on his right cheek? That's right. That's Russ Crowley. He's the guy who shot me. What does he want? Nothing. I gotta get out of here, though. I don't want to get you in trouble. Larry. What? Please let me call the police. No. But he'll kill you. I know he will. Let me take care of myself. But they shot you once. Please, Larry. Honey, there's an awful good reason why I can't. But you got... Look, Jean... I got a brother. He's older than me. His name is Fred. And he's been in trouble ever since I can remember. Trouble? Yeah, with the cops. Last week, he and three of his gang held up a bank. What? They held up a bank. Fred found out the other three guys were going to double-cross him, so he beat them to it and ran away with the loot. Were... Were you mixed up in it? No. But they came to my house and talked to my landlady. She told him I'd gotten a phone call from my brother. Well, how'd she know? The phone's in the hall. She answers it. These guys want to know where Fred went with the money. I'm not going to tell them. Larry, I think it's swell that you're nice to your brother, but if it means getting killed... Fred's sick. So sick he's only got about six months to live. That's why I can't go to the cops. Well, I'd have to tell him where he is. I don't want him to spend his last few months in any prison. What are you going to do, Larry? Well... One thing I've got to do for sure, and that's get out of here. You're safe here. You don't know that, Mom. You'll find out where you live. We already found out. Hey. Russ. How did you get here? I followed you. Oh. Okay, Larry. Start talking. <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. August 15th, 1952. This is your FBI on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Whether you're taking your pets on the road or a walk around the block, you need to be aware of heat stroke. Hi, I am Dr. Jose Arce, immediate past president of the American Veterinary Medical Association. It's important that pets get out and enjoy the warm weather and fresh air. But here are some reminders to help keep your pets safe in the heat. 
tune into the day's forecast to see how hot it will be. Limit exercise on hot days or schedule walks earlier or later on the day when it's cooler. If outside, stay on the grass instead of the hot pavement. Make sure your pet has unlimited fresh water and access to shade. Never leave your pet in a closed vehicle and leave your pet at home in air conditioning when you go out. If you see signs of heat strokes in your pet, such as excessive panting, drooling, unsteadiness or abnormal gum and tongue color, call your veterinarian or nearest emergency clinic. For more info on summer pet safety, visit avma.org. That's avma.org. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox Moore, this is your FBI and the Diamond Dance Stick-Up, August 15, 1952. <laughs> Now back to tonight's FBI file, The Dime a Dance Stick-Up. Tonight's case was chosen in order to point out the danger of assuming responsibility for strangers, particularly those who avoid help through the regular channels. The mere fact that Larry, although painfully wounded, had failed to report either to a hospital or the police, should have aroused Jean's suspicions. She should have reflected that a man who has been shot through the shoulder and who is obviously trying to hide it from the authorities is either a criminal himself or closely connected with criminals. She should have remembered also that harboring a criminal is an unlawful act and that one who does so thereby becomes what is legally known as an accessory after the fact. FBI agents are certainly not anxious to make people suffer because of their ignorance or good intentions. But they can't always protect such people against results of their own foolishness. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from a visit to the sanitarium and is relaying his information to his fellow agent, Chet Logan. Jim, did you find Gibson? Yeah. Where is he? He's still up at the sanitarium, Chet. I had him placed under protective custody. I see. What'd you get from him? Well, he admitted taking part in the stick-up. Oh, I brought back his written confession. It's in on the boss's desk now. How much did he tell you? Everything. Including the names of his accomplices? Yeah. He named the three others who worked on the job with him, and I've already sent out alarms on all three of them. Isn't it kind of odd that Gibson talks so freely, Jim? No, he had a reason for talking. What's that? Well, he says that he found out the gang was going to double-cross him, so he decided he'd double-cross them instead and run away with the loot. Uh -huh. This morning, he just received word that the other three hoodlums are gunning for his kid brother and may kill his brother if he doesn't tell him where he's hiding. That might be the truth. I think it might for one reason. Gibson still has that money someplace, and he offered to make us a deal. What kind of a deal? He says that if we capture the other three and in that way remove his kid brother from any danger, he'll turn in the money. Larry? What is it? You know I'm a nice fella. I don't like to hurt nobody. But I may have to start if you don't open up soon and tell me where your brother is. He has been telling you. He doesn't know. You keep out of this. She's right. I don't know where Fred is. Okay, kid. Let's forget about where he is. Make believe I'm not interested. We'll change the subject, okay? Fine. Suppose you just tell me where he stashed the dough. I don't know that either. Look, Larry, believe me, if it was just me, I'd just walk out of here and forget the whole thing. Then why don't you? What would I tell my partners? That I came here, you told me a story, and I was a big slob and said, forget it? They wouldn't understand, kid. So why don't you make it easy for both of us? Tell me where we can find Fred or the dough, and let me get out of here. For the hundredth time, I don't know. Look, kid, I never belted nobody who was laying in bed. Don't make me break my record. You leave him alone. You hear what I'm saying, Larry? I hear you. This is your last chance. Where's your brother? I don't know. Okay. I guess you got to get full treatment. <laughs> Jim, we just got a phone call from police headquarters. They arrested two of the three men who worked with Gibson. Which one's missing? Russ Crowley. Russ Crowley, I know him. He's a killer. Did you have any luck? Well, when I left here, I went up to the rooming house where Larry Gibson lives. I spoke to his landlady. 
He told me Larry hadn't been home last night at all. Do you know where he works? Yeah, it's in the garage over on 11th Street. I, I went there. I spoke to the night man. He said that a woman called earlier tonight about Larry. Said that he was sick and that he wouldn't be into work. You got her name? Well, just a first name. It was Jean. But the garage manager remembered that she said she worked at the Rainbow Ballroom. On Main Street? Yeah, that's the place. I called them, and they have a hostess named Jean, but she wasn't there. I think we should go over to the Rainbow Ballroom. Pardon me. Are you Miss Grace Wilbur? Yeah. Oh, we're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Okay. What do you want with me? We'd like to ask you a few questions about a girlfriend of yours. Jean Hayward. What about Jean? What happened to her? Nothing, we hope. Oh, no riddles, mister. Well, from what the manager says, Miss Hayward just came to work here last week. That's right. And he says that because you girls get paid on the first and thirteenth of the month... Could be. Well, we thought since you seem to be the only friend that she had up here, that, that you might give us her address. <laughs> you came to the wrong store, Mr. Taylor. I don't turn in my friends. We don't want to arrest Miss Hayward, but she might be in very serious danger. We'd like to help her. August 15th, 1952, this is your FBI, the conclusion next on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and Find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Thank you for listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now the conclusion of This Is Your FBI and the Diamond Dance Stick-Up, August 15th, 1952. Are you Loveland? We have absolutely no reason to want to arrest Miss Hayward. Please, you can take our word for that. Okay, what do you want to know? Where does she live? I don't know. I went there last Thursday night with her after work, but we went in a cab and... We were talking all the way. You know how it is. You don't pay much attention. Well, do you remember anything about the house? Uh, yeah. It was number 333. No. But I don't know what street it was because there was so much excitement. So much excitement about what? Well, there was a big fire right across the street, so we got out of the cab and ran right in the house. Uh, can you remember what kind of a building was on fire, Miss Wilbur? I, I think it was a store. Why? Well, we may be able to check the fire department records and see what fires they covered on Thursday night. Oh. Well, now, one other thing, Miss Wilbur. Did you take the cab to Miss Hayward's home from in front of the dance hall here? Yeah, we did. Now, this is very important. Do you remember how much the cab fare was? Yeah, I remember, because I paid it. The meter read 60 cents. Thanks. Chet, that means it's less than two miles from here. Yeah. Let's get a map of the city and check with the fire department on what fires they covered within a radius of two miles of here last Thursday night. <laughs> Break it up. Get away from the guy. It's time I went back to work. No, you can't hit him anymore. He's unconscious now. I just want to bring him to. No! Look, I told you before about that scream. If anybody comes in here, your boyfriend never gets off the bed. Now get away. Don't hit him anymore, please. I ain't going to hit him. I give you my word. All right, Larry. Come around. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Is there water in that glass? Yes. Give me it. Here. All right, Larry. Come on. Come on. That's it. What is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. 
I ain't working out on you anymore, kid. You hear that? Yeah. I got a better way to get my information. I'm using your girlfriend here. Huh? Here, let me lift you up for a minute. Mm. There. I want you to have a ringside seat for the main attraction. Leave her alone, Russ. Now, come here, sweetheart. No, let go of me. Now, watch this, Larry. <laughs> this will keep up till you decide to do business. You wanted to take any more? She's taking enough, Crawley. Uh, who are you? FBI. I got you. He's making a break. Come here. Uh. Thanks for trying to get away. Mr. You're not going to arrest Larry. No, Miss Hayward. We'll take care of Crowley. You take care of Larry. Russell Crowley was given a 25-year sentence in federal prison for bank robbery. The other members of his gang were sentenced to 15 years each for their part in the crime. And thus, by careful deduction and painstaking investigation, your FBI was able not only to round up the four criminals who wantonly robbed a bank, but also to save two young innocent people from further sadistic torture meted out by a brutal thug. In this case, as in so many others, time was an all-important factor. And for that reason, the special agents assigned to this case worked through the night. Criminals have no office hours. And as many of them have learned to their regret, neither does your FBI. Incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were B. Benaderet, Sam Edwards, Eddie Firestone, Joyce McCluskey, and Carlton Young. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. August 15th, 1952, this is your FBI on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we have part three of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Crystal Lake Cabin Matter. This episode originally broadcast August 15th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Betty Norton. I've been trying to call you. I know I was out. I'm sorry. You keep pretty late hours. It's after midnight. Did I wake you up? No. Good. Why don't you come over? The moon's real nice tonight. The lake is luscious. I'll come over, Betty. But not to talk about the moon or the water. Oh. Got something else on your mind, maybe? Yeah. A little thing called murder. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item six, two dollars. Tip to the Crystal Lake Hotel garage attendant for rousting him out of bed to get my car. I wanted very much to have another talk with Betty Norton, the wealthy, glamorous girl on the other side of the lake. She had told me she hadn't been with Edward Russell when he left the hotel bar the night he was murdered. But the bartender at the hotel swore that she and Russell had left together. If she'd lied about that, maybe she'd lied about a few other things. When I got to her Lakeshore mansion, she had a few well-spaced dim lights burning, a dreamy-type record playing, and some drinks mixed. The whole bit. Here you are, Johnny. Bourbon, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, You've got a good memory, Betty. Sure. I always remember what's important. Or what you want to remember. Same thing. Isn't 
How about the things you don't want to remember? Meaning? A couple of questions I want to ask you. Oh, now don't start making with those dull questions again. Look, let's just have a drink. <laughs> Last time I had to go swimming with you before you'd answer. This time it's got to be a drink, huh? Well, I thought we might dance, too. With you leading, I suppose. Sorry, Betty. I know you probably own quite a few things in this world, but the list stops short of me. I want some answers from you, and I want them now. Okay, so be a party pooper. So ask questions. You told me you met Edward Russell in the hotel bar the night he was murdered. You had one drink with him and left. That's right. You lied, Betty. Who says so? The bartender at the hotel. My, and I've always tipped him so well, too. Look, baby, suppose we cut the comic routines, huh? All right, so I left the bar with Russell. Why did you lie about it to me this afternoon? It's very simple, Johnny. Part of the Norton training, I guess. What does that mean? My father told me long ago I could do whatever I liked, but to keep it out of the newspapers. That's the way I've played it ever since. Well, go on. On that night you're talking about, Russell and the bartender got into a fight. I know. And that's why I lied to you. Believe me. I just didn't want to be mixed up in anything that could land in the papers. I see. What happened then? He and I went to a coffee shop to sober him up a little. You can check that. I will. Then what? He kept mumbling about somebody named Billy was looking for. Did he say much about him? No, he wasn't making very much sense. And then Hiram came into the coffee shop. Who? Hiram, the old fellow who drives what passes for a taxi here at the lake. He told Russell somebody wanted to see him. Russell left with Hiram. And you didn't see Russell after that? No, I didn't. You don't look convinced, Johnny. I'm not. You lied once before, you could be lying again. Sorry, I told you I lied before, but this time it's the truth. Mm -hmm. We're going to get in touch with Hiram. His number's on the cover of the local directory. Local directory. This one over here? Yes. Johnny, at this time of night? Yes, at this time of night. He doesn't usually take calls after midnight. Mm. Uh, sleep around somewhere, I guess. Well, I'll check him in the morning. And... What is it? Shh, quiet. Johnny, what is it? What's the matter? I thought I heard something outside here. Could it have been one of your servants? Well, I only have a housekeeper with me here, and she went to bed hours ago. Hmm. There are a lot of deer around here. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe. Johnny, you call Hiram in the morning. He'll back my story up. It's crazy thinking I had anything to do with Russell's murder. What possible reason could I have? A pretty weird one, maybe, but it might fit. You told me this afternoon you had to play everything your way. You've probably been doing it most of your life and getting away with it. Maybe Russell wouldn't cooperate. Are you kidding? Look, men like Russell are a dime a dozen. So I had a drink with him and got mixed up in a barroom brawl. I should have known better. But as far as getting interested in him, I wasn't. Believe me, I can always find others who like to... play it my way, as you put it. <laughs> What's the matter? Oh, you kill me. That gold-plated front you put on. I wonder if behind it you aren't just a hollow, lonely kid. Thanks a lot for reminding me, Mr. Freud. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess that was a little out of line. I guess I was asking for it. But you're wrong about me not being able to stand anyone who doesn't play it my way. You see, I found someone who won't. And I kind of like it. Kind of like you, that is. Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, look, uh, oh, I guess Oh, don't better... worry, I'm... Not going to try to appropriate you or, or to buy you. But about the loneliness? Don't leave just yet, Johnny. Stay just a, f a few minutes more. Okay. Just a few minutes. I guess I felt a little sorry for her and her loneliness. Or maybe it was... Well, anyway, I stayed a few minutes more. I think it was just a few minutes. My watch had stopped. First thing in the morning, I tried to get Hiram the cab driver on the phone again, but still no answer. I headed for Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett's office. 
Clarence Bixby, who owned the cabin where Russell's body was found, was with him. Good morning, Johnny. Hans, Mr. Bixby. Good morning, Dolly. Anything new? Not much. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, Sheriff. Uh, however, I would like to ask a favor of you, though. What is it? So far, the Denver papers haven't mentioned which cabin up here the body was found in. Now, I'd appreciate it if it could be kept that way. Otherwise, if it got out, I'm afraid my chances of selling the place would be pretty dim. Yeah, and anybody who'd want to buy it for that reason would probably be the kind of person not very welcome here at the lake. Okay, Bixby, sounds reasonable enough. I'll see what I can do. Much obliged, Sheriff. Cigar? No, thanks. Dollar? No, no thanks. Well, I'll see you later, fellas. I'll be around a day or two more if you want me for anything. Okay. Well, how do things look this morning, Johnny? Just like Bixby's cigar wrapper. Hmm? I wish he'd quit tying those things in knots. Every time he does it, it reminds me that we're right in the middle of a knot we can't untie. Yeah. It's a bear, all right. Oh, brother, it's worse than that. A guy named Edward Russell takes off from his home in Denver and disappears. He turns up here looking for a guy named Bill, of which there are too many in this town. Lynn Bixby brings a prospect up here to show his cabin, too. He finds the padlock's been switched. Russell's body inside. Yeah. Ants, the only person who stood to profit financially on Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary on his $50,000 insurance policy. Mm -hmm. But she couldn't have killed him. The Denver police established her in Denver at the time. Oh, incidentally, she's up here at the lake now, Johnny. Oh, yeah, she told me over the phone you wanted her to confirm the identification. How'd she bear up? Yeah, not too well. It was kind of rough. You got any information out of Betty Norton? Well, her story is she had coffee with Russell after his fracas with a bartender. Hiram, the cab driver, came in and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Russell went away with Hiram. You checked with Hiram? I've been trying to get in touch with him on the phone. No answer. Yeah, he's on the go a lot. He keeps his cab behind the hotel garage. We can check there and leave a message for him. Yeah, okay. Yes. What about Bixby as a possibility? I thought of that too, Johnny. It had taken an awful lot of nerve to kill a guy and then arrange to discover the body in your own cabin, but it sure would be quite a cover. Yeah. yeah but like you say, it'd take more nerve than most men have got. Besides, we run a check on Bixby, and we've turned up absolutely nothing to tie him into the deal at all. Now, there's no evidence he'd ever known Russell. I know. Leona Russell can't remember her husband ever mentioning Bixby's name. I, uh... Hey, wait a minute. How about Putnam? Well, the guy who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin? Yeah. The same thing could apply to him. He knew the cabin was empty. He could have planted Russell's body there and then arranged for Bixby to open the cabin. It could be, except how does he tie in? I don't know. He said he and his wife wanted to buy the cabin. Might be interesting to check with his wife and see what she says. Not a bad idea, Johnny. I'll put in a long-distance call to her. Don't count on much, though. At this point, Ansel, I'm counting on nothing. And I wasn't. I was getting nowhere trying to match a logical motive with any of the suspects. I decided I might as well continue checking guys named Bill around town and see if I could find the one Russell had been looking for. I went down to Bill's boathouse at the landing. Bill Jensen O'Rana was a stocky, heavyset man in his late 20s. His face looked friendly enough. That is, if you weren't paying much attention to his eyes. They were about the coldest shade of blue I'd ever seen. What can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Boat, maybe? A little information, maybe. <laughs> what about? A man named Edward Russell. The guy who was murdered? What about him? Did he come around here to your boathouse? Not that I know of. Well, he was looking for a man named Bill, and I thought you might be the one. <laughs> no. No, Aunt Garrett was telling me about him, but I'm not the one he was looking for. Sorry. Did you have to see him around town anywhere? Russell? Nope. First time I saw him was his picture in the paper after the killing. I see. Hey, you got quite a lot of boats here, Jensen. Yeah, pretty big investment in them. You keep the ones here in the boathouse padlocked, I see. No, I have to. Used to get one stolen now and then. Say, you want to take one out in the lake now, Mr. Dollar? Uh, not right now, Jensen. Maybe later. See you around. All of a sudden, I was real interested in Bill Jensen and his boathouse. Because some of the padlocks on the boats looked very much like the one that had been placed on Bixby's cabin door. The one he pried off when he discovered Russell's body. I wanted a closer look at those padlocks, but now wasn't the time. I went on back to the hotel to look for Hiram, but his taxi still wasn't there. So I left him a message to contact me as soon as possible. Then, after dark, I went back to the boathouse. There was nobody around. 
I slipped in the back and took a close look at the boat padlocks. Yeah, no doubt about it. They were the same kind as the one on Bixby's door. And one of them was missing. Yeah, Bill Jensen could be my boy. I hit the deck fast behind one of the boats and looked around me. It was a bad spot to be in. I was pinned against a wall. I edged toward the rear, then dove for the door of the tiny office. Then I realized my mistake. I'd figured that the office would have an outside door, but it didn't. I was trapped. Yeah, it looked like I'd just solved the murder. The hard way. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a shot in the dark that missed, and another that hit the bullseye. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. And there you have part three of the five-part Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar story, The Crystal Lake Matter, as it was originally broadcast August 16th, 1956. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. Would you do me a favor and thank this station and support their advertisers? It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every day we roll around here on your favorite radio station. Now, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single one of our episodes. You can find all of our shows on our webpage, classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand. You can learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find all the places that our shows are available through podcast. You can also find all of our social media links there. You can contact me directly, and you can buy me a copy. As a number of people have, that buy me a copy link does not go into the ground goodness that many of you love every morning, nor does it go into a Dr. Pepper for me, but it does go into helping us acquire new editions of great old-time radio shows. Thank you for tuning in, and tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.